Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and we have with us today Scott Carney. Scott, how are you, brother? Hey, man, I'm pretty good. How are you? That was an intense moment there. How we started? <laughs> Can that be a wedge? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> for those tuning into Scott for the first time, it's a little lucky that we've got him here because he's always around, out doing some really interesting, cool things. Um, author for the rest of the world but i guess from your perspective you're a investigative journalist would that be correct yeah i i I call myself an investigative journalist and an anthropologist and i can't really make up my mind which one i am at any given moment (laughs) so tell us a little bit scott how did you get into this uh into uh writing books and and such or like what was the call for being at this nexus of anthropology and also being an investigative journalist like what's going on in there yeah, so I, I went to, I, I was in a PhD program in Wisconsin, uh, and uh, you know, I was studying uh, South Asia. I was really interested in like something like not that important, actually. I was interested in Bollywood film. I was going to do a dissertation on that. Ah! I got to the dissertation <laughs> moment, and then I decided um, I didn't want to spend my life writing for uh, like five people to judge me for the rest of my life. And <laughs> I, I sort of dropped out of the program and yeah. uh, and moved over into journalism. I started writing for like Wired Magazine and NPR and, and you know, various uh, big American publications. Uh, and I was based out of India for a long time, which is, you know, really I just wanted it was like young Scott, like 19, 20 year old Scott wanted to spend as much time as he could in India. Mm. And and so I learned Hindi, and I fucked, I, I, can I swear? Can yeah, I you can be you. All no, right. Nice. And, <laughs> and say I, bad I to just, it's fine. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, so, so I wanted to hang out there for a, for a while, uh, and and you know, I, you know, initially I thought that anthropology was the way. You know, be a professor. You know, wear tweed, get some elbow patches, and and then that would be my life plan. It, it turns pot. out it's a terrible plan. <laughs> yeah. yeah to- oh, I mean, I do smoke pot because I'm in Colorado. So. Um, <laughs> That is definitely there, uh, but yeah. Now, but but I decided that I wanted to write. You know, I still wanted to ask the same questions, but I wanted to do it for a bigger audience. So mm-hmm. the things that I do now are essentially the the methods of anthropology and the questions of anthropology, which is like immersing yourself in a subject and trying to get also a big view at the same time, mm-hmm. sort of blending those two things. And then, but I'm writing for a popular audience. I'm writing for you know anyone who who can read and you know doesn't they don't have you don't have to wear tweed to listen to me uh, mm. and you know my first books where i was really known for looking into like organ trafficking i'm one of the you know, we, this is weird i'm a world expert on organ trafficking i'm one of like four um and i was tracking down people bought and sold kidneys and human skeletons and stuff like that mm. um and then i wrote a book about how meditation can kill you kid you not it can um it can, especially for people who are really drawn to the, the superpower side of meditation, right? When they're meditating to levitate or meditating to walk through walls, you know, there's, and there's a lot of people who are teaching that stuff out there. And it's, it is a path to madness. And I'd seen some people die on this path. Wow. And, and then a, a book that I'm probably most known for is called What Doesn't Kill Us. And it was where I met this guy at Wim Hof, who I thought was like one of these charlatan gurus who's going to teach you how to get superpowers and then you die. And I tried his method, but it worked. Mm. And and then my sort of life changed again because like instead of just killing you, meditation also has this positive side. Who knew? And <laughs> And, and so then I did that for a while. And Wim's method is basically immersing yourself in cold mm. and doing this breathing technique. And then, and then when you're in the cold, you relax. And when that happens, you find a, a different way to heat your body. And, you know, within a week, I was like climbing up a mountain in my bathing suit with, you know, no shirt. It was like um, eight degrees Fahrenheit, which is in, in Celsius, like negative 15. Yo. And... And, uh, and I was on the mound for eight hours. And, and so this sort of like has guided my life to where I am now, mm. where I'm, I'm, I basically just wrote this book called The Wedge, which is really about, uh, it's how when you give yourself stress, physical stress, mm. uh, and you have this moment of opportunity where you can decide what that stress means. 
right? And, and then when you do that, it changes the way your body works fundamentally. It changes your physiology. So just that moment, that thinking, and, and you know, the word the wedge is like separating stimulus from response. There's mm-hmm. that gap there. And you're shoving, I guess what, your intention in between that point. And when you do that, that changes literally your physiology. Hmm. I love that. Thank you so much. That was so coherent and just such a beautiful way of articulating where we're at. And I uh, and I uh, like the wedge. Wow. I um as I was reading the book, I was reflecting on some of the things that um were present for me. And even just there's so many places where we go our stimulus and then the subsequent response is unaccounted for in our day-to-day life. Like we just we we react out of out of habit, out of nature. And I think just the the as a key um, tenant that I took away from the book was this idea that you know the, you have so much opportunity to um, to be present you know more and more often and write your own story you know and it's not necessarily a call to being in control all the time but it's more of a call to being mm-hmm. aware to finding out what actually serves mm-hmm. you correct sure yeah I mean we're not in control of much right I mean. <laughs> We're in control of our bodies in general, but not always, right? We, we, we're in we're control of our actions that we take, but there's a lot of stuff in this world, I don't know if you've noticed, that we have no power <laughs> over, right? right? Zero, like it doesn't matter if it's a politician or like global warming or I don't know, what your mother said to you. I mean, <laughs> you don't really have much power in, in that stuff, but we do have some power over how we react to these things. Mm. Uh, and. And I think a lot of that boils down to like the state that our nervous system is in, uh, where, you know, we really, like the nervous system really only has two states that it can be in. One is called parasympathetic and one is called sympathetic. And and parasympathetic is like your rest and digest, your total relaxed state. And sympathetic is your like full on adrenaline and cortisol. uh, uh, it's, It's your fight or flight responses. And these are two, and, and and the reason why there's only two states is because it's all innervated by the vagus nerve. It's this nerve that sort of you know you have two big nerves in your body. You have the spinal cord, you have the vagus, and the spinal cord. If you break that, you're pretty screwed because you can't move your legs anymore. <laughs> yeah, let's right? not even talk about that. <laughs> yeah. But it, but your vagus is just is is. But the reason why you can survive when you've broken your spinal cord is because the vagus is still sending information down to those body parts. Mm-hmm. That's why if you have someone with a spinal injury, you put them in ice water, their their veins will literally contract and they will mm-hmm. respond to the stimulus from the outside world. So there's two branches of the vagus nerve. One is the parasympathetic branch and one is the, the sympathetic branch and you have no other branches, mm-hmm. which means you either have to be in a, in a fight or flight response or you have to be in rest and digest or some mixture of those two branches at the same time. There are no other options. I love that. And so whereabouts in the body is the vagus nerve? Um, it, it's, it, it sort of runs, uh, you know, that's actually a really good question. It, it, it sort of runs right in front of the spinal cord um, and, and sort of in the chest. And it's got all these branches that go all over the place. Uh, and yeah, I am not an expert on the anatomy. And when, when I say two branches, it's actually, it's, a, it's like a tree right mm, and there's exactly. tons of stuff in there so i'm i'm simplifying it a little bit um, but yeah i mean you have the spinal cord that's your somatic nerves that's the stuff you have conscious control over yeah but the vagus nerve for the most part responds to automatic stimulus right so like if if you're cold mm. your vagus nerve is dealing with the cold right if you see a lion and you start feeling that anxiety that's your vagus nerve giving that that anxiety whereas if you grab the spear and want to stab the lion that's your spinal cord giving that information to the world. So they, they work in conjunction, uh, but in general, the vagus is like sort of the more mysterious one. It's the one that you don't have direct control over, although you can control it because if you put yourself in front of a lion, you've now controlled it because you've changed your <laughs> external stimulation and you're like, oh God, vagus. So, so you, have the, you have this ability to sort of indirectly Do not try this work. at home. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Exactly. But no, totally. So, and then what you what I'm hearing is some elements of like CBT, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy, like where you can yeah, of course, size yourself mm-hmm. a little bits and pieces as you introduce these um, these pieces. And so, one of the things that um, I guess just right now in this conversation is present for me is just like 
you writing the book The Wedge in such a potent time where I personally feel like we spend a lot of time and let's just call sympathetic jacked and parasympathetic relaxed. We spend a sure. lot of time jacked. Um, oh, yeah. And Stephen Kotler, when I read some of his work, and it's just like, you know, 20th century normal is just like impregnated mm-hmm. with anxiety. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's just like, and, mm-hmm. um, and I know that a lot of, actually uh, almost all the techniques in the book can help with anxiety um, when yes. I was looking through it. Um, yeah, is that, is that some part of why you wrote the book now? And tell us a little bit about... Um, yeah, I guess uh, just the current state of affairs from your perspective in terms of why we spend so much time jacked in that relationship with our nervous system. Well, I mean, you know, there's there's part of it's like this Western lifestyles. We're always trying to be awesome, right? I mean, and not everyone is trying to be awesome, but there's a, there's this feeling in the world that you have to optimize. You have to be the best. You know, you look at Instagram and if you don't have the better six pack than the other person, and I don't even have a six pack, right? I have like a 40 ounce, but the, 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 like, there's always this sort of competition. So there's that we're, we're certainly trying to become some version of perfection out there. And I think that's a big mistake, right? Like, like th- this drive to be and to compare ourselves against other people and then also achieve some ideal state that not, we're not even sure what it is because once you achieve it, you're gonna look at somebody else like, no, I wanna be over in that one, right? And, and I, think that's, I think that's a an issue, but but we have we really love grit, right? Especially as an American, like we love the stories of the dude who fucking made it up the mountain, right? Mm-hmm. Who just pushed himself up the mountain, and uh, despite adversity, and maybe in doing it, he even hurt himself to get up the mountain. Right? Maybe even his toe died, right? Yeah, you know, and like this is the stuff that we love because we want that like mm-hmm. that idea of self overcoming. And like one of the best selling books in America is called Grit. Uh, you know, it's like straight up there. And, you know, it's it's like it's the idea of like oh like imposing your will on the world um the other one and you mentioned stephen kotler and he's great on this you know he talks about flow and you know many other people talk about flow as well he didn't invent the idea but this is about cooperating with the environment this about cooperating with the energy around you and um and it's weird We're, we're so obsessed with grit and individuality that we look at flow and we're like oh man michael jordan yeah he's in flow right you know oh yeah that guy yeah he's like these best people and we and we sort of valorize the 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 moment of that person when they're it flows really about connecting it's about like you know you're in flow with your teammates you're in flow with you know the things around you and it shouldn't be about your ego so we've even made flow like the the (laughs) egolessness about your ego i mean i don't know we're screwed man it's, it's hard (laughs) <laughs> I love that. So tell us a little bit about uh, of all the techniques that are available to basically what I see as being waging in for that intention to drop us out of um, f- to shift state is basically what I see. Um, and sure. uh, what what is your what are your go tos? What are your favorite um, wedges? Uh, so the book has ten, like roughly ten techniques in it that that I um, I do, uh, but it's I, what I don't want people to think is when they read this book that there's here's the ten things to make you super awesome. It's not like a recipe book. Like you know the things that I do, I do breath work. I do this thing where I confront fear by throwing heavy objects around. Like you know, but no, and I do ayahuasca. I do you know MDMA therapy there's float tanks, there's weird diet stuff. And, and all of this is, is, are just stuff that I thought was interesting and that sort of gave me a lens into mm. uh, the, to who we are as people. And, and the, the real fundamental principle here is that you are, a, you know, who you are as a person is defined by who you are and how you respond under stress. Right. Like, you know, when you're on your couch and you're watching Netflix, this is not the pinnacle of your existence. Right. This does not this should not define you as a person Mm -hmm. that you who you are, the person who's actually challenging yourself at some point, which doesn't mean avoid Netflix. I love Netflix. There's lots of good shows on it. And Mm -hmm. and you should have those resting states. Those are very important. But when you think about who you are, that should not be the thing that defines you. You should be a person who should can, can take on challenges, difficult or otherwise. And when you face those challenges, the important thing to realize is that there are sensations that go with that, right? That, and that these sensations come in through your nerves and they evoke emotions. 
And mm -hmm. so when you're facing down something which is terrifying, whatever it is, maybe it's a maybe you saw a panda, right? And the panda to you was terrifying. Other people may not be scared of that panda, <laughs> right? But to you, it was a terrifying panda. And then you feel this, and then you can modulate that sensation because literally there are things going on in your body. And, and the way I, the easiest way to liken the wedge is to think about a sneeze, right? You have this sneeze coming on, and and you know it's like. How do you describe those sensations? It's like pain, tickling, something in your nose. It's sort of your wrinkling, right? And you can feel the wrinkling happen. But and you can think to yourself, though, I don't want to sneeze, or I want to delay the sneeze. And there's something you can do to stop that process from going on. And I don't know how to describe it, but we all know what that what you do to do that. And yeah. and 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 this is the same thing you can do with your emotions. This is the same thing you can do when you're facing down that lion, right? You can be overcome with fear and that ultimately leads to paralyzation usually. Or you can look at your sensations as it's happening and be like, no, I'm gonna be here in the moment. I'm gonna try to figure this out. And this is really what the wedge is. And there's no reason to train yourself never to sneeze again, right? <laughs> but 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 I want to make that association between the external environment, the sensation and the emotion. It's all part of one process that acts together. Yeah, I love that. And so what is it about the human condition? Do you think that, you know, there's this, on one hand, you know, you referred that, you know, there's this drive to be perfection and, you know, grit and uh, excellence and extraordinary or all these words that we value as a society. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, there is some level of the human condition where we find ourselves at the extremes um, and it yes. doesn't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. Find ourselves at the extremes and by no means um, in the book, have you gone through, I guess what you were saying is not a comprehensive list of all the extremes that one can face, but these were the ones that, that you, um, you chose to dive into and right. in that, yeah, what do you use on a day to day in terms of what does mm -hmm. the average like when is it in different situations you end up uh, confronting yourself in different ways? And right. what, is, what is the impetus for you to go so, there? Like, why even do this? So every morning, I so my morning routine is I do the Wim Hof method, which is uh, it's a breath protocol where essentially you hyperventilate. It's not actual hyperventilation, but it looks like hyperventilation. And then you exhale and you hold your breath and then you hyperventilate and you hold your breath. And eventually you hold your breath for a really long period of time. Uh, and I take a cold shower. I do after that. And then in the cold shower, you know, that if you think about the sensation coming on your body, it's like clenching, right? And I live in Colorado, so our water might be a little colder than where you are. But like, you know, it comes out and you just want to squeeze up and fight it. But the goal in the cold shower is actually to relax in that stressful situation. And I find that when I do these things, the day is just better because I've yeah. already faced something difficult, right? When I've when I'm doing the breath work and I and and, I, and I'm um, you know, the first thing that you do in the breath work, right? It's hyperventilation at first, which for the people who first do the Wim Hof method, right? At this point, I've been doing it for like 11 years, but, but the people who first do it, sometimes this will invoke panic in their bodies because, because mm -hmm. they'll be breathing fast. It sounds like this. <sighs> and for some people, just those phys physical motions of their body mm -hmm. is, is like a panic attack and they'll actually feel more and more anxiety. Right, mm. and so this is this is essentially triggering your sympathetic nervous system. This is your fight or flight response, and you're you're going the back way into it, right? Because usually the fight or flight gets triggered because you saw the lion, then you hyperventilated. But now what we're doing is we're hyperventilating first, and so then we feel like we're facing down a lion. Mm. Um, so you do that, and then you exhale, and you hold your breath. Now in this, this is really interesting because at the first. Um, this is parasympathetic, which means it's rest and digest. It feels awesome because you just breathed a lot and now you're holding your breath and you feel great. But what you're trying to do is actually push against the, the, the stress of, of, of feeling unrelaxed, you know, because you can sort of feel this welling up in your body where you're relaxed, but you're like, well, no, pretty soon I'm going to have to gasp, right? <laughs> and so you're thinking to yourself, no, I want to stay in this parasympathetic rest and digest as long as possible. So you're actually pushing on the other branch of the vagus nerve at this point. Mm. And then come to the point where you're, you're, you're holding your breath for a really long period of time. I don't know how long it is for you, but you know, the first round for me, it's one minute, then it's two minutes and it's three minutes on the third round. But as you're getting towards that gasp point, you then ratchet back up into the sympathetic nervous system. So we're really toggling these nervous system traits and, and, and exercising them. And when we do these sorts of practices, you know, uh, and I think this gets back to one of, one of your earlier questions, when it's not, you don't do, you don't 
do the Wim Hof method or hyperventilate to become a better hyperventilator. Right? <laughs> you, don't, yeah, you don't yeah. do it to become a better ice showerer. No, yeah. you face these stresses to become more emotionally resilient in general. So that, you know, remember you only have these two branches, right? A lion that you, you, you see triggers your fight or flight responses in the same way that doing your 401k, uh, you don't have those, um, doing your taxes yeah. uh, might, might um, make you anxious, but it's the same nervous system. So when we're able to control those branches, we're able to control, have emotional resilience in all um, areas. So this helps depression, this helps anxiety, this helps ennui, this, hand, you know, lust, like all of those emotions still go through that same nervous system. So you start to get a tool to control all of it. Mm. And I think it's really um, powerful what you're sharing because somehow we often, like I know in the morning, like for me, the cold shower, one of my hacks is I've actually learned to dance in the cold shower and that helps okay. me really mm -hmm. relax. Um, sure. And so with the, like tapping into like these different practices, some, like it's hard to, from an objective standpoint, just go, why would you be cold showering? Why would you be hyperventilating mm -hmm. first thing in the morning? Why bring all this into your life? And so you mentioned that some of the benefits are emotional resilience. And when you read the book, right. it makes a lot of sense. Um, but share with us some of the benefits of actually being able to modulate our response to stimulus um, mm. with, with clear intention and the, like how that can improve our lives. Well, I mean, the, 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 we, we've already sort of mentioned anxiety and depression, right? Mm. And, and anxiety is essentially triggering your fight or flight responses and not giving it an output, right? Because mm. if you're, you know, if you, if we go back to, you know, your paleolithic ancestor, you saw the lion on the savanna. The reason your body dumped the adrenaline in the first place was to give you the energy to fight the lion, to stab the lion in the face or run away from the lion, right? Mm. It's your fight or flight responses. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was evolutionary, it made sense. But in the modern world, we don't have those same threats. I mean, I don't remember the last time I fought a lion. I mean, for a <laughs> long time, right? And 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 now, but now I'm I got my taxes. I still only have that same nervous system. So now I I, I my taxes come in, but I can't stab my taxes even though I want to. Um, <laughs> but 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 now I've dumped that adrenaline. I've dumped that cortisol, and then it has nowhere to go because there 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 were. The, the dangers of the earlier world had physical responses and that gave us, you know, the whole emotional cycle was taken care of in that. So this is bad because in the world we're full, like social media makes us anxious. The, the internet makes us, I mean, it just about everything mm. makes us anxious. And, and it's, and, and literally those stress hormones are, are going to our body. So once we manage to, to manage that, we become more emotionally just better. Um, you know, it's probably also smart to stop those stimulus from coming in, right? Because the one thing you can do is if you're doing the cold shower, you have given it an outlet, but if you still flood yourself with this stuff, it just makes you unhappy again. Um, mm. And the other thing that's really amazing is autoimmunity, right? So one of the plagues uh -huh. of modern humans is the fact that we have autoimmune illnesses there's it's at epidemic proportions and and this is like arthritis this is lupus this is um crohn's disease you know these things where your body is attacking itself not because you have a virus like covid which you know covid's bad right but but pre-covid right your, your your body's just attacking itself and for me i always used to get canker sores like which are these like mouth ulcers that were really painful and i'd get them probably every uh, month and they'd last a week in my mouth and they were super painful and I didn't like them. Um, I started doing the Wim Hof method, which is, is giving you feeding me my body stress and then I control myself in that stress. And the canker sores never came back. And that was like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was an autoimmune thing. And the way I think of it, the metaphor that I use mm -hmm. is that if you think of your body and your immune system, these, these, these cells that go out to kill like bacteria and viruses and whatever else, they're in your body. When you see that you, you look at your taxes, you dump adrenaline in your body, right? Mm -hmm. And then those and 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 those cells then are bathing in adrenaline. So so if you think of those cells as wolves, you just jacked up your wolves. Mm -hmm. And now, but they don't even have bacteria to fight. So they're just running around and they're chomping on you. And so, and that's how I got my canker sores. When we get um, but when you give it something to do, like 
cold shower or any of these exercises that I'm doing, you have to give it a physical output. Those, that adrenaline gets used up correctly by your body and you've effectively given your wolves chew toys. So that's that's one reason, you know, that 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 we see so many people having autoimmune improvement here. And it's not just me saying it, some dude on a podcast. There's actually pretty good science here, especially around the Wim Hof method. Uh, but I think the principles are generalizable even outside the Wim Hof method. But what they what they have shown in clinical studies is that they injected Wim. And also people he, he trained with a um, bacteria that was dead that provokes an immune response. So usually you would get like a fever when you get injected with this, it's called endotoxin and it's E. coli bacteria. So you inject it and a normal person gets a fever, but then your body's like, wait a minute, this isn't real. And then your fever goes away once it's figured out what the problem is. Now they injected whim and also people he trained with endotoxin. And he said he could stop the immune response from happening. And they did, and he stopped his immune response. He didn't have a fever, he didn't have a cold, didn't have the chills, didn't have those flu things. So what they showed in the clinical setting is that you can actually control these things that are uncontrollable. And this is why we see so much autoimmune, like generalized and weird autoimmune illness is just mm. going away because of um, things like the Wim Hof method. And I think we'll see this in, um, it's not to put Wim on this pedestal. He's just the 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 genre that I have gone in through. Mm. Um, but you know, in many ways, the placebo effect is built on this idea, right? It was a, is that you get a medicine and it makes you feel better, even if you haven't like. If you think about you're you're feeling ill, someone gives you a pill and says this will make you feel better, and you're like, actually, yeah, just taking the pill makes you feel better, mm. regardless of the chemical activity, because there's this intention behind it, this or mm. this expectation behind it. And while medicine generally says that's not real, right? Placebo effect's not real, you know, it's not real medicine. Um, you can't argue with the fact that some people get better. It works. <laughs> and, <laughs> it works. And and when we do placebo controlled trials, it's very important to realize that now for some things, placebo doesn't work. Like if you have a bacterial infection, there is no placebo effect for the bacteria. But for, for most chronic conditions, you'll have a very significant um, section, like 20 or 30% of the effectiveness of a drug might be the placebo effect. And the drug might be only effective 25 to 35% of the time. So mm. yeah, you've got 5% on the chemical, but it doesn't mean that that the, the rest of it was uh, meaningless. Mm. Did that make sense when I, the way I described that? Because yeah. I, I think I can, okay. No, it totally did. It totally did. And one of the questions I've got in there is just uh, for my own personal, like I've noticed um caffeine is not one of my greatest allies even though i love coffee mm. like i love right. coffee and as soon as i drink it um i can feel just how woof, like just how jacked i get yeah. and um on that on that like i can just see like as a collective like and i'm from a part of australia called melbourne and we love our coffee heard of it like we love coffee mm -hmm. we're coffee fanatics here and um and just how jacked it drops you into your sympathetic like it just drops you straight into your sympathetic nervous system and i can feel that mm -hmm. holding that clenching and it's great if i've got tasks to do but even just the body's response because a lot of the time we're at, and i love the way you put it like because we're sitting and we're doing tasks as we're trying to can, mm -hmm. like channel that energy um and I, I find like the body afterwards is, is not in the best place either and so sure yeah and I, even just like walking down supermarket aisles i remember um, early on, this is like a while ago now, but I remember walking down the, um, I was in a pretty open state and I walked down the, the supermarket aisles and I could just feel, like feel like all the airbrushed pictures of everybody and all the white packaging and how everyone's just like picture perfect. Yeah. And I could actually feel the anxiety pouring off the packets. Sure. And I was just like, sure. dude, like, do we even stand a chance with today's society? Like there is just like this billboards with people airbrushed, like you said, yeah. six packs. I remember <laughs> I, in researching you, I saw this point where your mum was like, you don't have a beach, but <laughs> thanks, mum. Your mum called mom you out for that? you not being an underwear model or something. Oh, I don't, did she? Oh, it's true. I'm not an underwear model. She may have. I, don't, I don't remember this particular thing, but you know, I, I my mom could have said a lot of different things. <laughs> and, um, but like even just the, the billboards where, yeah, like there's this like airbrush versions of what uh, societal right. is pressure to be this is what you're meant to look like and it's just like right. no one in a four kilometer radius kind of looks like that you know maybe a handful of people right 
right? And that's like right. Well, they're way. trying to use em emotions to make you a better capitalist. I mean, that's the thing is that that you know, I I had this one chapter where I talk about um, eating just potatoes for uh, a few days, right? I think three or four days. I'm eating just potatoes, and the reason I'm doing this is to extract sensation um, taste from my palate, right? And there's a whole diet side of this where you can lose weight or whatever, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in eating a very, very bland food that completely satiates hunger because potatoes are filling. Mm. And, and, and then how does that uncouple the emotion that I have um, with taste from the nutrient value of something? Because the reason we have taste in the first place is to give us useful information about what foods we can eat and mm. not die from in the world right so so sweet tastes are you know quick energy you know it's it's it, there, there's reasons for that but we have actually a very sensitive palate with a whole world of tastes and all of those tastes actually connect to emotions now what has happened in the capitalist sort of horrible the world that we live in yeah. is that Right. They have now said, look, we have a strong taste and they use a very high volume taste. And a lot of the times I'm talking about the volume of the signal. For instance, an ice bath is a loud signal. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, a Cheeto is also a loud signal. Right. And mm -hmm. then they, they, they put like a, a certain uh, their emotion with it, you know, like there's like going to be a party in your mouth if you eat this. So, so they're, 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 they're creating, they're really trying to create these associations with a biological sensation mm. and then hijack it over to an emotional response. Whereas where we came from, this was supposed to be like you're walking around the, you know, whatever, the or arboreal ancestral forest, you're looking around, you see a berry, and the taste of that berry actually gives you nutrient information for what you need to do to survive next. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the question you asked is like, how do we get out of this? I'm like, I don't know, man, we are screwed because it's <laughs> everywhere. And, and, and I'm not a person who's like, let's go back to the land, let's be paleolithic or whatever. I just say, let's be aware of how we are manipulated um, by uh, our, our, like our emotional system being hijacked. And when you I pair that emotion with a sensation, man, that's powerful. Mm, I love that. And so, brother, share with us for those that uh, haven't read the book yet. What's the like? How do we go about actually implementing? Uh, how do we how do we bring ourselves to stand a chance in today's like you know in today's society? I know there's so many techniques in the wedge, cold showers sure. being one of them, um, and you know plant medicines being some. All these different things that we can access. Um, mm -hmm. What are the what are on the day to day? What are the what are the things that you would recommend uh, for those that are tuning in? actually take home and start implementing safely so i mean one thing that you can do is do your like we want to bond sensation and emotion that's the root of of the wedge here and then usually we have emotions attached to sensations that that are that pre-exist right if you think about right now jumping in a cold shower you have never taken a cold shower you're going to have this clenching horrible association with that cold shower so one of the reasons why we do the cold shower um, is to be like, no, that's okay, right? Mm. And we're trying to put, like, literally, like, bond a new emotion to that thing. So I would say that when you do difficult things, whatever that difficult thing happens to be, try to do it in a mindset that you want to project forward into the future with that thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, don't put your hand in a fire and be like, this is the most joyous moment of my life. That's not good, right? But do mm -hmm. do something where you are, you know, where you might find difficult and then try to make it, um, you know, have that positive attitude as you go in. Another thing you can do is something that, um, something that you already love doing, right? Let's say you have a thing that you already, the joy is already part of that, that um, experience. You can make that experience then difficult for yourself emotionally in order to, to, to change some other fundamental associations in your body. And one thing I suggest, trying at least, is do a cardio exercise that you like, running, bicycling, something like that, doesn't matter. Um, and something, and now try to do that just breathing through your nose. And mm -hmm. what this is going to do is, is give you 
initially a sensation of anxiety because you've taken something that where you're sort of on the edge already and now you're just breathing so you're restricting your airflow which is going to build up anxiety and th there's chemical reasons for this in the book mm -hmm. where where we talk about building because what will happen is you'll build up co2 and we're biologically hardwired for anxiety to co2 because breath is like the master switch of everything so when we restrict co2 you're going to find it more difficult to to sort of exist however if we're doing a cardio exercise and we're breathing just through our nose, at first it's going to be terrible and your performance is going to drop like crazy. However, you will also start to begin to build tolerance to CO2, which means that in the future, you're gonna be more tolerant to anxiety. Uh, and, and you can get into the more of the chemistry in these chapters on breathing that I have, but I would say do a, one wedge practice is do a cardio exercise just breathing through your nose and stick with it for a little bit. Like the first time is definitely going to be terrible and the third time is definitely going to be terrible, but it might start to get pretty interesting at the 10th time you do it. Sweet, new challenge for, the, for getting out on the bike and uh, breathing through the nose. <laughs> And uh, yeah. yeah, I think uh, I, I definitely resonate with what you're sharing in terms of what comes up for me is uh, pairing the response that you want. So, and when for me, the cold shower is like dancing, sometimes I'm singing in the cold shower and I'll try and sing louder sure. in the cold <laughs> than I do sure. when it's warm just to make it. And I like, I'll try and force a smile through. Like oh. um, when I'm doing my Wim Hof breathing, it's like, I can see that like sometimes like I'm in a really tense, like ground up state. And in that it's like, okay, bring in a smile, like, you know, you want to be able to mm -hmm. smile through this and cultivate mm -hmm. a way that you actually want to be through the response. So I like what you're doing in the shower because of course what you're doing is the dancing is a joy, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the cold is the stress. And so you're bonding the joy to the stress. Mm -hmm. So that's really good. That's a, a, a wonderfully powerful wedge. Um, however, I'll say that both of those are both on the sympathetic pathway to some degree because dancing is sort of moving, it's energetic. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you wanna do in the shower is actually bring all the way in over to the parasympathetic side. You wanna try to rest and digest. So you might be sort of, actually tricking yourself into still using the sympathetic pathway yeah. while you're in the shower. So I think that what you should try is, is really just to sit there and you can, you can move a little bit. You can even have good ideas in your head, mm -hmm. but don't try to just misappropriate the, um, the fight or flight response by pairing it with the joy, try to actually just go deep into the rest and digest. See if you could rest in the shower. It's not to say that what you're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. There is no wrong, right? There's, there's no wrong in any of this. Um, but, but try to see if you can also just get relaxed in the shower instead of just keeping an uptone. I love that. I love that so much. And uh, I think the big takeaway for me is, yeah, just finding, um, for me, meditation is a great way to come back into into that rest and i and i and i lean on it so heavily i had a, a background mm -hmm. with depression and you know it completely i say meditation reconstituted my life and sure. what i'm hearing after and i should have picked up more of this from the book but what i'm hearing from us in today's conversation is actually um the act of hormesis uh, but not it just not being like isolated to the gym or to the workouts that we're doing but actually the hormesis of day-to-day -day living Right. Right. And so like we're, we're and hormesis for those that it's a new word. It's basically hormesis is when you go to the gym, you like ex, uh, extend or exercise a muscle and it breaks down, but then you rest and it comes back stronger. And then it breaks down mm -hmm. again, you rest, it comes back stronger. That process is hormesis, right? And so what I'm hearing from Scott's work for me personally is that, yeah, you know, we, we break down in life, you know, there's all these challenges, but then giving us that rest, dropping back into the sympathetic nervous system is so important so that we actually mm -hmm. can come back stronger, fuller, better, and uh, ready for the next challenge. Is that a, a, probably a good way to put it, bro? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's great. I mean, you know, you, the reason why we take on challenges is so that we can expand our range and our capabilities and not just physically it's not just about getting muscles go yeah. get muscles if you want them but but it allows us to be more active like if you think about um like the spectrum of of where we are comfortable right if if you are just just hew towards comfort all the time, then you find that you're able to be comfortable in fewer and fewer locations until you're not comfortable anywhere. And so the reason why you try to challenge yourself uh, is that you can be comfortable in more places. And, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the key here. And, 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 but nothing here should 
you know, it, it's easy to think that what I'm suggesting is very extreme, that it's very like you have to always be pushing the boundary because now we get into that individual stuff again, the grit stuff. Mm -hmm. And and that's not the goal. The goal is to be like, look, we are capable of doing that. And what we want is contrast, right? Mm -hmm. We just and, and and the problem with the person who's always grit is that there's no contrast. And the person that and the, the problem with the person who's always on the couch is that there's no contrast. What we want to be able to do is do both. I want you to be able to rest and I want you to be able to run. And, and I think we all want that, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we all love sleeping. I mean, I do. <laughs> and, and, and most of us love like being active, right? And so yeah. we want to have that range and that's what we want to hew towards. Uh, and, and don't be a fanatic, but push yourself. I love that range is, uh, yeah, something that really resonates with me. And I really feel that one of the key fundamental tenets of health that is not often discussed, but I'm hearing and, and like you do discuss um, quite eloquently is just, you know, the like human beings, I think we got to where we are and maybe, you know, you can shed more light on this being the anthropologist, um, but like so much of it is our relationship with our ability to be dynamic. Like even just right mm -hmm. now, like the COVID situation that's going around the world, we went from like completely mobile, mobilized to like, zoof, like, you know, working from mm -hmm. silos in hibernation and we're managing to make it work. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking at like the human's capacity to be dynamic. Like we're such a mm -hmm. dynamic species. And yet when we try and funnel ourselves into like one way of being, and like you said, comfort will kill us eventually. If it's just like, that's all we do and trying to add that range. But fundamentally that is our health, right? Being able to go from like explore mm -hmm. the ranges, you know, and staying in that space to be like, okay, I can also go here and I can also access that. And for right. me, like I went from like, I, I'm, probably need a better word for this, but from bro mentality, like I was in and out of the gym for a long time for about nine years. And to a point where I was just like trying to get patterns of movement where it was squatting, deadlifting, whatever. And from there it was like, actually, these are just patterns of movement that I'm getting good at. But like when I jump on a surfboard, it doesn't really help me that much more. Like I want to be able right. to do mm -hmm. different things in different environments right. and still show up right. for them and still be able to do it. So that dynamicness became like the like the key indicator of health for me. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's such like um, the the uh, just to, to give an example from a movie that I rather enjoy. And I don't know if you've seen this one, but it, I think it's Rocky Four. Right. I don't know if you've seen it. This is the one where Rocky goes and fights the Russian in during during the Cold War. I don't do you, or does this bring any bells for you? OK, yeah, well, I'm going to give you the, the, the yeah. I'm going to give you the the, uh, the the gist of it. So in this for some reason, whoever wrote this movie wasn't a crazy, but the Russian was the guy who was like made by science, right? He's in like a high tech gym and they're injecting him with steroids and he looks awesome. Like he's got, he's, he's, he's just like this perfect Adonis yeah. physical thing. And, and then there's Sylvester Stallone, who's like sort of this, you know, Stallone is, is jacked, but he's like, you know, he's rough, rough right? Yeah. He's a rough dude. And and, we're, and the way Rocky trains is he's like lifting, he's like pulling wagons and he's like running through snow and like he's in like a barn and just using what he can around him to get awesome. And, and then they, they have a fight and Rocky wins. But, you know, I, I like this dynamic because one side is like the super scientific side of things, right? Mm -hmm. You measure every, every um, you know, chemical in your body and you, you get all the diagnostics and you know exactly what's going on. Somehow that's going to give you the, the the ideal optimized state but then there's the other side which is like no we just have to have heart we have to use this stuff around us and and try to become a dynamic person and improvise so there's all these other things going going and if we all had writers navigating our lives we'd always win and we'd always be rocky but you know i i think that the the, the real point here though is that is that there's um there's reason to be dynamic because if we are so hyper specialized that we're only good at one thing, then what's the point of any of this, right? Mm -hmm. If I, if I become, you know, I want everyone to be a dilettante, right? <laughs> I, I want everyone to try everything um, that they want to, and wouldn't that be great? And, 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 and if the thing that you want to do is get super specialized and just know about one thing, then that's fine too. But, but it's cool to have that dynamism. It's cool to be able to like, you know, paint and also run and also be the best at none of it. Mm. Right? Just don't, just don't even try to be the best. Just realize that, the, that someone's going to be on that magazine cover for the stuff that they do and God bless them. But yeah. you don't need to, we don't need to be the best because we're not going to be, because there can only be one best. And it's, it's not going to be me. It's not going to be you. Like, just give it up. 
<laughs> I love that temperance and just the, the ability to then explore all the colors and all the palettes of everything that's available for us. Hey, Scott, I'm conscious of the time, brother. Is there, in the last few moments that we start wrapping things up, um, is there something that you're burning to share with the audience of Inspired Evolution while we've got you here? No, I think that we've, you know, I like your title, Inspired Evolution, because it has the idea that we have um, the ability to um, evolve as people, but also to some degree as a species. You know, we've essentially stopped evolving as mammals, right? Because Mostly because of the way we, we mix genes. I mean, there's certain pressures on us where we have actually now rely more on technology to yeah. affect our bodies than the brutal natural selection, which got which we were doing for a billion years. And it's a better place to be. But, but, but in order to still progress, we really do need to try to be conscious, right? Mm -hmm. We do need to, you know, our species, our bio, our, our livers may not get better, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. we do have some ability to try to start thinking at a species level to try to sort of reorganize and think outside of just you know the barrier of our skin but try to connect with people and i think that that's probably a message that um hopefully resonates with you too is like we need we need to start thinking bigger and start thinking about um you know not only who we are as individuals but who we are as a community of people together absolutely brother and that was going to be one of my questions what does the inspired evolution mean to you but you already nailed it and i think from where you're going just to touch on i think there's a whole nother podcast episode in there and just uh yeah what's coming up in you know the like you said, you know, like humans, we can't really, or we can't really, but we, our heads have gotten to the capacity where if they were any bigger and we came out of our mothers, we'd kill them. So we're kind of tapped out at our biological uh, standpoint mm -hmm. um, from some of the perspectives, but then yet we're using technology to uh, like evolve into the future. Mm -hmm. But then also like, because that's such an exponential growth that technology goes through and we are such linear like beings in our, in our in the relationship with our environment, the stress that that packs in as well, again just to end on that just like to to reflect back to everybody like the amount of screen time we share the amount of information that comes in in such a rapid way you know all these things just the world like like 20th century normal that that baseline of just anxiety that's present for us mm -hmm. and i think that's just an ode to to yeah grab yourself a copy of the wedge there's all these techniques in there and they don't all have to be for you and even like i noticed that like even after reading the book it was just like right like i use i've got my own wedges you know and tuning into yeah. like there is so much opportunity for us to just look at the look at the stimuluses in our life and not have to demonize them but just go hey like what is my response Do you know what i mean and just be aware mm -hmm. like okay, maybe when i sit at the computer for two hours i leave like a bit like edgy and frustrated and a bit little bit on the like aggro side of things and then just going from there okay so that actually leaves me jacked and then from there perhaps it's a good idea to go for a run to go do something different to like you know move things mm -hmm. around and find your find your response right. Yeah, I agreed. Yeah, find a practice that that also matches your mind because because sitting at your computer is a practice, right? <laughs> You're doing something, and that's a practice. So find something that out that balances that out. That's good. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, your presence here today. Um, yeah, just the conversation around stress is such a deep. Uh, one for all of us for me personally I just and I love the conversation like I sometimes I go into these places even in my coaching where it's just like wow it's just parasympathetic and sympathetic it's literally just parasympathetic and sympathetic and like mm -hmm. you can just see it in people when they're walking around it's like dude that dude's jack this dude's relaxed that yeah. dude's jack and you can literally right. see it and more people that you walk past are generally jack than they are relaxed um mm -hmm. they're not walking past like with their hands behind their back whistling you know and just mm -hmm. like how as a society we see that and just the book and the work you've done um so I just want to thank you for your presence, your time, your energy here today, bro. And obviously the book, you know, you've, you've gone, gone out and done some pretty radical things in the book that are definitely worth reading your experiences. And so I just want to acknowledge all of that and also just the journey that you've been on in life to be able to be so informed to write the book, have this conversation here today. Thank you for that. Great. Well, I appreciate you having me on. It's really great to be here. And uh, yeah, um, take care. Appreciate it, brother. All the best for the future. All right. Thank you. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve.